Hello, everybody. So in this video, we are going to be looking at early American presidencies. Specifically, we are going to be focusing on the first five presidents of the United States. These are the key terms that you should be able to define by the end of the video. Now, I know there's a lot of them, but here we go. The first, George Washington, John Adams, Cabinet, the Judiciary Act of 1789, Hamilton's financial plan, Federalist, Democratic Republican, the XYZ Affair, Alien and Sedition Acts, Thomas Jefferson, John Marshall, the Louisiana Purchase, James Madison, the War of 1812, James Monroe, and the Monroe Doctrine. Let's start with our first president, President George Washington and his administration. In 1789, George Washington was unanimously elected president by the Electoral College. He was the only presidential nominee to ever be honored unanimously, and many believe that Congress was willing to give the presidency power due to Washington's immense respectability. He was the general that led Americans to victory in the Revolutionary War. As the first president, Washington set precedent by creating a cabinet. He consulted cabinet members or department heads in order to make decisions. It should be noted that the Constitution does not mention a cabinet, but since he created the first cabinet, it has since become an integral part of the presidency. The first cabinet included Thomas Jefferson as the Secretary of State, Alexander Hamilton as the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Knox as the Secretary of War, and Edmund Randolph as the Attorney General. This cabinet was characterized by a political feud between Jefferson and Hamilton, a Democratic Republican, and a staunch Federalist. Now I'd like to focus on the domestic policies of the Washington presidency. The first is the Judiciary Act of 1789. Now the Constitution mentions the creation of a federal judiciary or a court system, but it doesn't outline exactly what the judiciary should look like. So this is what the Judiciary Act does. It organizes the Supreme Court with a Chief Justice, in this case John Jay, and five associates. It also organized federal, district, and circuit courts and established the Office of Attorney General to head the Department of Justice. Another major policy of the Washington presidency was the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton's financial plan. There were five major components of his financial plan. The first was funding at par, or redeeming bonds at face value to bolster national credit. Hamilton urged Congress to pay off the entire national debt by funding at par all government bonds incurred by the states during the Revolutionary War. Debts would be paid at face value plus accumulated interest. He believed that this would give confidence to investors, that they would make back their money. However, Hamilton was bitterly criticized for not alerting original bondholders to the plan as they sold their bonds for a fraction of their value. The second component of Hamilton's financial plan was the assumption of state debts. This further obligates states to the federal government. Hamilton believed that the national debt was a blessing that could cement the union. It could make the United States stronger. Now, states with huge debts obviously favored this plan, places like Massachusetts, while states with less debt or no remaining debt hated being taxed to pay somebody else's debt. Virginia was particularly angry over this component. The third part of his plan were tariffs or custom duties. This was a major source of revenue for paying off debt. Now, tariff revenues depended on a healthy foreign trade, and the Revenue Act of 1789 imposed an 8% tariff on dutiable imports. This was the first tariff law in U.S. history passed at the national level. Uh, the secondary goal of these tariffs was to help protect infant industries, because if you're taxing or putting tariffs on imported goods, you want to invest more on industries being created within your own country. The fourth component, and arguably one of the more controversial components of Hamilton's financial plan, was the excise tax, or a tax on a specific good. In this case, in 1791, Congress passed an excise tax on whiskey. 
backcountry distillers were most affected by the seven cent per gallon tax, but Hamilton wasn't overly concerned with their protests from the frontier. And the fifth component of Hamilton's financial plan, and arguably the most controversial aspect of it, was the idea of a, nat a national bank. This was the most important Hamilton versus Thomas Jefferson issue. So what Hamilton does is he sets up a national bank with the government being a major stockholder despite the bank being a private corporation. One fifth of the members of its board of directors would be government appointees. The federal treasury would deposit its surplus revenues in the bank and federal funds would then stimulate businesses by remaining in circulation. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison strongly opposed the bank. States' writers feared that their liberties would be jeopardized by a huge central bank. They thought that moneyed interests would benefit at the expense of farmers, and that state banks would not be able to compete against the federal bank. Opponents of the bank were also people who had a strict interpretation of the Constitution. They were known as strict constructionists. So people like Jefferson believed that the Constitution did not stipulate the creation of a national bank, therefore it shouldn't exist. Hamilton, who was a proponent of the bank, argued for a loose construction approach to the Constitution, a more broad interpretation of the Constitution, where he said that the Constitution would support a plan for the National Bank. This idea is known as the Elastic Clause, that the Constitution provided for passing any laws necessary and proper to carry out the powers vested in the various governmental agencies. Hamilton argued that the bank would be necessary to store revenues from taxes and the regulation of trade, both of which were stated in the Constitution. Washington reluctantly signed the bank measure into law in 1791 with a charter for 20 years, and this is where we start to see some north-south friction surfacing. Essentially, the bank favored commercial and financial centers in the north, and the agricultural south saw their state banks decline. So I mentioned in the previous slide that the excise tax was one of the more controversial aspects of Hamilton's financial plan. And this is why. Pennsylvania farmers were hard hit by Hamilton's excise tax. These so-called whiskey boys then began to pose a major challenge to the new national government. They began to torch buildings. They tarred and feathered revenue officers and chased government supporters from the region. Some even talked of secession from the United States until tax collection came to a halt. In response, Washington summoned the militia of several states, resulting in the creation of a 13,000-man army. When the troops reached the hills of western Pennsylvania, the Whiskey Boys dispersed without any casualties. This showed that the federal government could ensure domestic tranquility, that another type of rebellion like Shays' Rebellion could not succeed under the new Constitution. The Founding Fathers in 1787 did not envision the existence of political parties. In fact, organized opposition seemed disloyal and against the spirit of national unity. However, by 1793, two well-defined groups had materialized, the Hamiltonian Federalists and the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans. The Federalists emerged from the Federalists at the Constitutional Convention. They believed in government by the upper classes, the so-called best people. They felt that the rich had more leisure time to study the problems of governing and that they enjoyed the advantages of intelligence, education, and culture. Many of them distrusted the common people. They believed that democracy was too important to be left to just any old person. Federalists also supported a strong central government, where they sought to maintain law and order to, in order to crush sort of democratic rebellions, things like Shays' Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion. The Federalist Party was dominated by merchants, manufacturers, and shippers. Most supporters lived in urban areas on the eastern seaboard where commerce and manufacturing flourished. Because of that, they believed that the federal government should encourage business and not interfere with it. The Democratic Republicans emerged from the Anti-Federalists at the Constitutional Convention.
The Democratic Republicans advocated the rule of the people, government for the people, by the people. However, they also believed that only those who were literate enough to inform themselves should be able to vote. Despite that, they believed in the wisdom of the common people, the fact that the masses were teachable. Democratic Republicans appealed to the middle class, farmers, laborers, artisans, and small shopkeepers. One of the biggest platforms of the Democratic Republicans was their belief in states' rights. They felt that the government that governs best governs least. So now that we've taken a look at the domestic policies of the Washington presidency and seen how those domestic policies contributed to the rise of political parties, I want us to take a look at the foreign policies of the Washington presidency. Many of these foreign policies became important issues separating Federalists and Democratic Republicans in the 1790s. So let's start with the French Revolution. Many Americans were initially excited about the French Revolution, especially the Democratic Republicans. They saw the French Revolution as sort of the second chapter of the American Revolution. In 1792, Americans supported France's war against Austria and Prussia. But by the mid-1790s, the reign of terror had begun and it led to political conflict in the United States. This was when King Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette were beheaded and thousands of aristocrats and anti-revolutionaries were executed by the Committee of Public Safety. Democratic Republicans regretted the bloodshed but felt that it was probably something that couldn't have been avoided, whereas the Federalists were frightened by the extent of the violence. They viewed the Democratic Republican masses with concern and a little bit of fear. So the French Revolution ends up leading to a world war and Britain gets sucked into the conflict against France. And the United States has to decide which side to support when the war spreads to the Atlantic and the Caribbean. This is when President Washington issues his neutrality proclamation. He announces that US neutrality in the war between Britain and France. Now, even though the U.S. was technically obligated to France under the Franco-American Alliance of 1778, President Washington believed that war should be avoided at all costs. This led to a sort of split reaction amongst the parties. Jeffersonians or Democratic Republicans were enraged, especially by Washington not consulting Congress, while the Federalists supported neutrality. In 1797, Washington refused to accept a third term as president. In fact, he had reluctantly accepted a second term at the urging of his supporters, where he was once again unanimously elected. This is where he sets the precedent for the two-term presidency. In his farewell address, where he gives advice for the continued success of a young nation, President Washington issues several warnings, the most important probably being his warning against the evil of political parties and his warning against permanent foreign alliances. This leads us to our second president, John Adams. Um, John Adams was the vice president and became the Federalist candidate. Alexander Hamilton was kind of too controversial of a choice to be a viable candidate, so the Federalists went for John Adams. The Democratic Republicans gathered around Thomas Jefferson, um, but ultimately Adams defeats Jefferson 71 to 68 in the Electoral College. Jefferson, as the runner-up, becomes the vice president. So now I'd like to take a look at the foreign policies of the Adams presidency. Most of the foreign policy is within the quasi-war against France, which lasts from 1798 to 1800. Now, what the quasi-war is, is when the French government uh, condemns the Jay Treaty, which is a treaty that was signed between the U.S. and England, and they begin to attack American shipping. They view the Jay Treaty as an initial step towards a U.S. alliance with Britain, and they saw it as a flagrant violation of the Franco-American Treaty of 1778. So French warships begin to seize about 300 U.S. merchant vessels by mid-1797. In response to this, uh, President Adams sends a U.S. delegation to Paris. The U.S. delegates were secretly approached by three French agents, X, Y, and Z. 
The French agents demand a bribe, $250,000, for the privilege of talking to French Foreign Minister Talleyrand. Negotiations between the French and the United States break down, and war hysteria begins to sweep America. By 1798, there was undeclared naval warfare with France, and U.S. war preparations were set in motion. This is when the Marine Corps were established, and an army of 10,000 men was authorized. Adams also suspended all trade with France and authorized American ships to capture armed French vessels. These undeclared hostilities occurred for two and a half years. Within that time, the U.S. Navy captures over 80 armed French ships and several hundred U.S. merchantmen were killed by the French. Though a full-blown war seemed imminent, the French became eager to negotiate peace with the United States by 1800. So Adams appoints a new foreign minister in France to negotiate. In 1800, the U.S. negotiates with Napoleon. France agrees to end the 22-year-old Franco-American alliance and a major war is avoided. So the quasi-war with France leads to the controversial domestic policies of the Adams presidency. In 1798, the Federalists passed a series of oppressive laws to reduce the influence of Democratic Republicans and silence anti-war opposition. These acts were known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien Act raised residence requirements for U.S. citizenship from five years to 14 years and stated that the president could deport so-called dangerous foreigners. The Democratic Republicans saw this as an attack on them. Most immigrants lacked wealth and were welcomed by the Democratic Republicans, and they were later hated by Federalists who didn't want these immigrants voting for the Democratic Republicans in the United States. In some ways, these laws seemed reasonable. Some foreign agitators were coming into the United States, for example, Citizen Genet, who tried to enlist Americans to support France. Also, many immigrants from France sought anti-British policies in the U.S. government. Now, despite this controversial act, the Alien Acts were never actually enforced, but they frightened some foreign agitators who ended up leaving the country. The Sedition Act stated that anyone who impeded government policies or falsely criticized its officials would be liable to heavy fines or imprisonment. This was a direct violation of the First Amendment, but the Federalist-controlled Supreme Court wasn't interested in declaring it unconstitutional. Unlike the Alien Act, the Sedition Act was actually enforced, and 10 Jeffersonian newspaper editors were brought to trial and convicted. The law expired in 1801, the day before Adams left office. And this sort of demonstrates the dubious intentions of the bill. If a Federalist wasn't elected in 1800, then the Democratic Republicans wouldn't have the Sedition Act to prosecute the Federalists. So the Democratic Republicans believed that the Alien and Sedition Acts were unconstitutional, but the issue was that the process of deciding the constitutionality of federal laws wasn't defined yet in the Constitution. So Thomas Jefferson and James Madison secretly created a series of resolutions. The premise of these resolutions was that the states had the right to nullify laws passed by Congress that were deemed unconstitutional. The only two states that pass these resolutions are Virginia and Kentucky, and that's why they're known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. What's important to note here is that the idea of nullification was used by Southerners later to support an, um, nullification and ultimately the secession prior to the Civil War. So at the election of 1800, the Federalists were at a disadvantage. The Alien and Sedition Act had become a liability, and the Federalists had swelled the national debt in preparation for a war with France that never really happened. So in what is now known as the Revolution of 1800, it was John Adams versus Thomas Jefferson versus Aaron Burr. And this was the first example of political campaigning for a presidential election, particularly between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. The Federalists accused Jefferson of being an elitist, being an atheist, robbing a widow of her trust fund, and impregnating his slave. And not all of these attacks were made up. 
Jefferson had, in fact, fathered at least one child from his slave, Sally Hemings. So after a pretty nasty campaign, Jefferson ends up defeating Adams, with most of his support coming from the South and the West. However, Jefferson ties with Burr, so the House of Representatives needs to break the tie. They end up going with Thomas Jefferson, and Burr becomes the vice president. This was an important defeat because it marks the first party overturn and sets the precedent for a peaceful transfer of power, where one party can lead office and another party can take over. Thomas Jefferson famously said, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists, because he wanted to convey that no matter what party was in office, we were all Americans. As president, Jefferson surprisingly kept most of Hamilton's financial plan intact. He sought to heal the political rift between both parties, and he realized that as president, he didn't have the luxury of being an ideologue, as he was now responsible for the entire country. In office, he retained most government servants from the Federalist administration, and he kept the Hamiltonian system intact, with the exception of the excise taxes. So he maintained the Bank of the U.S., he retained the tariff, and he didn't tamper with Federalist programs for funding the national debt at par and the assumption of state debts. He does, however, begin to reverse certain Federalist policies. For example, he pardons people sentenced under the sedition laws. He reduces the size of the standing army because he believes that the government that governs least governs best. He encouraged states' rights and the development of an agrarian nation. Jefferson was also successful in substantially reducing the national debt. He believed that the national debt was a curse and not a blessing like Hamilton believed. So under his presidency, um, he was able to balance the budget by cutting government spending, and the debt fell from $80 million to $57 million. Now, one of the last things that the Federalist Congress did before they lost power was passed the Judiciary Act of 1801. This act created 16 new judgeships and other judicial offices. Adams continued on his last day in office signing commissions of the Federalist Midnight Judges. They're called Midnight Judges because they were appointed as judges at the last possible second. Now, the newly Republican Congress repeals this act. Despite this, John Marshall, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and was appointed by John Adams right before he left office, remains in power. He maintained Federalist principles in his decisions even after the Federalists lost power, and his decisions greatly increased the power of the federal government over states. One of his most important contributions was the idea of judicial review. What John Marshall did was he gave the Supreme Court power to rule a law by Congress unconstitutional. Another major domestic policy of the Jefferson presidency was the Louisiana Purchase. In 1800, Napoleon persuaded Spain to cede the Louisiana region to France. Jefferson sought to buy New Orleans from France and as much land as possible to the east for $10 million. What Jefferson wanted was New Orleans as a port because it was a strategic trading location. Even though he really just wanted the port of New Orleans, Jefferson ends up with 828,000 square miles worth of land, nearly doubling the size of the country. And as a strict constructionist, he believed that the Constitution didn't authorize the president to negotiate treaties incorporating huge amounts of new land into the U.S. So he accepted the treaty, but he did so pretty reluctantly. The Louisiana Purchase paved the way for westward expansion, and that saw the removal of indigenous Americans and the opposition to free African American migration westward. So now we've reached our fourth president, James Madison. Madison was a Democratic Republican who was strongly Jeffersonian in his views. His presidency lasted two terms from 1809 to 1817. One of the major foreign policy issues of the Madison presidency was the War of 1812. So the War of 1812 has several causes, the first being British interference with American shipping. In 1805, Britain established a partial blockade and prevented some American ships from making port in Europe. 
Britain also engaged in impressment, which is capturing American sailors and forcing them to work on British ships. Now, one of the bigger causes, or the more important cause of the War of 1812 was the War Hawks. The War Hawks were members of Congress who were new, young, and nationalistic. They tended to be from the South and the West, and they wanted to prove themselves through a war with Britain, and they sought the glory that their fathers had in the Revolutionary War. The War Hawks were outraged at British impressment of U.S. sailors, so they sought to take over Spanish Florida because Spanish Florida was Britain's ally. They also hoped to conquer Canada. Canada at the time was seen as vulnerable to attack because Britain was preoccupied with Napoleon taking over parts of Europe. They also hoped to remove further American Indian threats. In 1811, the Western Warhawks sought to wipe out renewed American Indian resistance against white settlers in the Western wilderness. The Shawnee Confederation posed the biggest threat. There were two Shawnee twin brothers, Tecumseh and Prophet, who had organized a confederacy of all the tribes east of the Mississippi. Tecumseh was a noted warrior and perhaps the most gifted organizer of American Indians in U.S. history. He believed in fairness between tribes and selling per and purchasing land that belonged to all American Indians. Amer Americans thought that the British were aiding them, and it turned out that they were right. The British were supplying the indigenous Americans with guns. But General William Harrison repelled a surprise Indian attack at Tippecanoe, which essentially ended the American Indian quote-unquote threat in the Old Northwest. It further spurred westward expansion, and American Indians were pushed further west. So with all of these causes, with British interference of American shipping and the war hawks and their battle at Tippecanoe, the U.S. declares war on Britain in June of 1812. So the War of 1812 was a pretty small war. 6,000 Americans were killed or wounded. Mostly Canadians fought Americans and very few British fought. The U.S. was militarily unprepared for the war, but they do manage several major victories. One of the more infamous battles of the War of 1812 was the Battle of New Orleans. This was a British attack on American troops. Basically, Andrew Jackson commands about 7,000 men, and he manages to kill about 2,000 British people in a half hour, compared to about um, 70 Americans being killed by the British. Ironically, this battle was unnecessary because the Treaty of Ghent had been signed two weeks earlier, um, which said that the war would end as a stalemate. Now, despite Andrew Jackson winning a battle that was not necessary to winning the war, it results in a lot of American pride and nationalism. So the effects of the War of 1812, you can see um, American nationalism is encouraged. It also shattered indigenous American resistance and officially brings an end to the Federalist Party. The domestic policies of the Madison presidency can really be characterized by Speaker of the House Henry Clay's American system. The American system is made up of three parts. The first is the Second National Bank, which was created by Congress in 1816. The lack of a national bank during the War of 1812 hurt the economy. So to fix this, Henry Clay creates the second national bank, which was modeled after the first national bank, but had 3.5 times more capital. The second part of the American system was the Tariff of 1816. Its purpose was to protect U.S. manufacturing from British competition. After the war, Britain flooded the U.S. with cheap goods often below cost, to undercut new American industries. The United States saw this as an attempt to crush U.S. factories. This was the first protective tariff in U.S. history, and it imposed roughly 20 to 25 percent duties on imports. It wasn't really high enough, though, to provide effective protection. But it started a protective trend in U.S. trade. Now, there was a lot of sectionalism over the tariff. John C. Calhoun represented Southern views. After initially supporting the 1816 tariff, he opposed it, claiming it enriched New England manufacturers at the South's expense. Daniel Webster represented Northern views. 
He opposed the 1816 tariff as shippers in New England feared the tariff would damage their industry. Henry Clay, however, saw the tariffs as a way to develop a strong domestic market. He believed that Eastern trade would flourish under tariff protection and that tariff revenues would fund roads and canals in the West, especially in the Ohio Valley. The third part of the American system was internal improvements, although this part of the plan failed to pass. So what happens is that Congress passes Calhoun's bonus bill in 1817, and this bill would have given funds to states for internal improvements. President Madison, however, vetoes the bill, claiming it was unconstitutional. In fact, many Democratic Republicans oppose direct federal support of um, intrastate internal improvements because they saw it as a state's rights issue. All right, so now we're at our fifth president, James Monroe. James Monroe was elected in 1816, and his election marks the official death of the Federalist Party. His presidency also marks the era of good feelings. However, this is somewhat of a misnomer because there were serious issues dividing the nation throughout his presidency. Monroe's presidency oversaw two major events, the Panic of 1819 and the Missouri Compromise. The Panic of 1819 was an economic crash and depression that hit the U.S. in 1819. It was the first financial panic since the Articles of Confederation era in the 1780s. So some of the causes of the 1819 panic include overspeculation on frontier lands by banks, inflation from the War of 1812, and an economic drop-off after the war, especially in cotton, which results in a vulnerable economy and then a, a significant deficit in the balance of trade between the U.S. and Britain. The Panic of 1819 resulted in calls for reform and pressure for increased democracy. Western farmers viewed the bank as an evil financial monster, and hard-hit poor classes looked for a more responsive government. The second major issue of the Monroe presidency was the Missouri Compromise, and this starts when Missouri applies for statehood in 1819. People were concerned that admitting Missouri would throw off the sectional balance of states. At the time, there were 11 slave states and 11 um, free states. So Henry Clay mediates and Congress admits Missouri as a slave state and admits Maine as a free state. Maine had previously been a part of Massachusetts. This keeps the sectional balance of the state even. So there were 12 slave states and 12 free states for the next 15 years. Future slavery was also prohibited north of latitude 3630. So two major foreign policies of the Monroe presidency are the Florida Purchase Treaty of 1819 and the Monroe Doctrine. So at the time, President Monroe is concerned that American Indians are entering into U.S. territory to attack settlers and then retreating into Florida. So he orders Andrew Jackson, who famously fought the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812, to attack the American Indians and, if necessary, pursue them back into Florida. Andrew Jackson ends up fighting throughout Central and Eastern Florida during the First Seminole War, and he executes two American Indian chiefs and two British supporters of Spain who held uh, Florida as their territory still. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams convinced Monroe's cabinet to offer an ultimatum to Spain. Basically, they needed to control their outlaws, the people who were going into American territory, or they needed to cede Florida to the United States. Spain realized that it would lose Florida in any case, so they decided to negotiate. This ends up with the adams onis Treaty, or the Florida Purchase Treaty of 1819, where Spain cedes Florida as well as its claims to Oregon to the United States. The second big foreign policy was the Monroe Doctrine. It was written in 1823 by John Quincy Adams and was given as the president's annual message to Congress. In it, he warned European imperial powers. He said that they could keep existing colonies in the Western Hemisphere, but could not gain any new ones. He also said that Latin American republics should be allowed to govern themselves. 
nationalistic Americans widely supported this as it maintained Washington's tradition of avoiding entangling alliances. But Latin American countries saw the U.S. as merely protecting their own interests. All right, so you made it to the end of the video, and these are your key takeaways. Political leaders in the 1790s took a variety of positions on issues such as the relationship between the national government and the states, economic policy, foreign policy, and the balance between liberty and order. This led to the formation of political parties, most significantly the Federalists led by Alexander Hamilton, and the Democratic-Republican Party led by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. George Washington's farewell address encouraged national unity as he cautioned against political factions. In the early 1800s, national political parties continued to debate issues such as the tariff, powers of the federal government, and relations with European powers and plans to further unify the U.S. economy, such as the American system, generated debates over whether such policies would benefit agriculture or industry, potentially favoring different sections of the country.